I'm not going anywhere, but here comes the flash flood. What you are about to see is a disaster that goes beyond what words can describe. Turn around, the flash flood's right there. It was beyond our wildest imagination what happened. Oh my God, Bob. What you're looking at is way beyond a mudslide. Close the door. A mudslide is an inconvenience. This is a mountainside that came down. What roared down that hillside under a blanket of darkness and confusion tore homes from their very foundations. Wake that up, wake that up. What happened here was no mudslide. That word does not work. What we really had here was a massive movement of rock. We're talking a tsunami of debris, water and boulders as big as cars. This was the night. It rained boulders. To say what happened here was a mudslide really doesn't do it justice. This neighborhood was crushed by fast moving boulders. I'm 5'9". This is nearly double my height. Sitting on top of a rapidly moving river of mud were tree trunks, man-made debris, and all of these boulders, that is what cracked these homes in half. Everyone stay calm. This is literally as high as the kitchen counters. It took only moments for the mud and rocks to lay waste to parts of Montecito, California, 80 miles outside of Los Angeles. This disaster actually started with a monster-sized fire. We're in Ventura County, California, where 65,000 acres have already burned on the Thomas Fire. The Thomas Fire burn scar would soon quadruple in size. It ended up burning over 281,000 acres. We are on the front lines of a wildland firefight. That's me, Dave Malkoff. I've been covering these California wildfires for over a decade now. This one, however, was different. It was not only the largest in California history, but it also set up a disaster that would crumble a mountain and kill more than 20 people. You see, in very simple terms here, the top layer of mountains are held together by trees and bushes. And when all that burns away, one big storm can make it all fall apart. There was nothing holding these rocks in anymore. This is what Montecito, California looked like before the boulders rained down. People will come here and will often say, okay, we're gonna help you find your piece of paradise. That's Rebecca Riskin talking right there. She's been called the first lady of luxury real estate. I'm just telling you what it's like living here. It's great hearing her voice, because I almost run what she sounded like. Julia Riskin lost her mother when a boulder rolled through her house. My mom was in bed and she heard a loud explosion. Julia's brother Robert was at home with his family. Julia, however, saw it happen. Every Sunday night was a movie night, so I was staying the night at my mom's house. My sister has special needs and my sister relied on her for everything. I also have Asperger's syndrome which is high-functioning autism, so maybe it's our savior for me. What started as a movie night turned into a drama on a scale nobody imagined. I'm trying not to get too emotional because I, my mom wouldn't want me getting emotional. She'd want me to be happy because she was a happy person. She was one of the warmest people, the warmest person I've ever known. She loved hiking. I hated it. She hiked and walked a lot, actually, every morning. That's her down there, hiking the very trails that would soon crumble in record rainfall. That is also what has taken my mom from this world is, you know, what she loves so much. And, you know, it's going to take some time, I think, for me to be more comfortable kind of going up there and, and seeing that. The debris and rocks and mud took out a large section of wall. She was taken down about two miles, almost to the 101 freeway. She was killed pretty instantly. This is a look inside Rebecca Riskin's home. Daughter Julia's life was saved only because she chose to sleep in a bedroom where the walls didn't come down. I just broke down in tears and it haunts me. It does, I have nightmares about it. It's a nightmare that was playing out all over town in the middle of the night. 14-year-old Lauren Canton, a Riskin family friend, 
was trapped underground for two and a half hours in the shattered remains of her house. Montecito firefighters Andy Rupp and Ben Hauser just happened to be walking by. And he goes, did you hear that? He thought maybe it was coming from the distance. We're, we're in an area where there were a number of homes. Someone's calling for help. And I told him, I said, no, I, th I think it's coming from this pile. Got down low and put my ear up to the pile. As we climbed on top of it, Andy crawled on top of the pile. And I yelled out, fire department, is anyone in there? And then I could hear Lauren. Yeah, I'm over here. She was able to walk herself to the ambulance that we had staged by, uh, by the debris pile. What Lauren doesn't know at this moment, what she will soon find out, is that her father, sitting in the middle there, died in the disaster. Her teenage brother is still technically missing. You're friends with Lauren Canton. Yeah, she's amazing. I was so happy to hear she had survived. She's an inspiration. We understood that this could be a very devastating event. This is the mountain that frightened firefighters for decades, their worst case scenario. It was an unprecedented winter fire at the same time as an unprecedented winter rainfall. And since the fire took everything off the mountain, there was nothing to hold it back. So it just came apart in all that rain, pouring all of its boulders and debris down this gorge towards Montecito and all those sleeping people. Let's take you back in time here so we can explain exactly what's going on in our 3D environment. If you ask a geologist, they've got a name for this. It's called a debris flow or a boulder fall, but this one was almost inevitable. After a wet start to 2017, portions of Southern California experienced their driest March through December on record. These mountains became a carpet of flammable fuel. See those dry Santa Ana winds? They were gusting over 50 miles an hour. This was just a tinderbox, and once ignited, it started the largest wildfire in California history. You remember that, the Thomas Fire? After the flames burned out, this charred landscape was left behind, covered in what they call a hydrophobic soil. It's water resistant, just like concrete. In fact, let's take a closer look at that so we can see how it works. The rain just pours on top of it. It doesn't seep into the soil. It's no longer a sponge, it just pours right off. That's a simulation there. But on January 9th, that's exactly what happened in the pre-dawn hours. Over an inch of rain fell in less than 30 minutes. Water was raging down the mountain, picking up the sinister mix of mud and rocks and tree trunks in huge boulders that raced down towards the sleeping city of Montecito. After this all dried, it became almost a concrete substance with victims trapped inside. It's a hard image to get out of my head really hard. The families in this neighborhood that did survive, they barely made it out alive. This is Greg and Daphne Tebby's house. There's an old street over there. Coming up, we take you along with the dog team in charge of finding loved ones trapped in the debris. And later, the fire chief that predicted this night would come. The night it rained boulders. We knew that this was a possibility. It's rock, trees, there's fields of boulders now. They weren't there a week and a half ago. You're on board a firefighting airplane loaded with heavy flame retardant. The crew is fighting the most destructive brush fire in California history. Underneath the Thomas fire is the city of Montecito. Montecito Fire Chief Jennifer. Yeah, hi. My son and my ex-husband seem to be trapped in their house. Are they safe? They said they're trapped in the kitchen. A monster rainstorm threw so much water on the fire-stripped land, the mountain came apart. Where are they? Are they inside the house? They are outside of the house. I'm not sure if they're on the roof. It was more than a mudslide. It was the night in rain boulders. Okay, so we're going to uh, work from north up to the freeway. You are riding with an elite canine team from Santa Barbara County Search and Rescue. These dogs know how to find human remains. Rick Stein and his team have that grim job on this muddy road. Has this area been checked before? Not by us. The mud carried trees and boulders as tall as houses down that broken hillside. It came in fast, demolishing homes and sweeping victims away in the middle of the night. You said the flow kind of came down through this area. As the dog team searched, we saw remains of cars, 
crushed by boulders and swept all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Not far from the shoreline is California's 101 freeway. Some parts were buried under 15 feet of mud. Our search has now brought us to the major overpass in the middle of downtown. Just moments ago, Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department K-9 units hit on something possible down here. They're not sure if it's a body or a body part, but they've called in a secondary dog to check it out. Both dog trainers want to find those missing victims. When cadaver dogs sit like that, trainers know there's a reason. That's a signal they found something. Families need to know what happened to their loved ones, but the water and the earth were moving so quickly that night, some people could have been nearly swept out to sea. This parking garage sits where the ocean meets the land. Its lower levels were filled with mud, bearing countless vehicles in a high tide that didn't come from the ocean. It came from the previously burned hillside. Yet today's search turned up empty. The sunset with two children still missing. Just days ago, they were playing in these neighborhoods. The debris came down that mountain so fast and with so much destructive force. The families in this neighborhood that did survive, they barely made it out alive. This is Greg and Daphne Tebby's house. He was here and caught it all on his cell phone. I was in the house that night. Fortunately, my family was not. They were evacuated. Mudslides, boulder slides, call them what you want. They are fairly predictable. After a big fire, there's rain. That rain brings disaster. I could see on the radar there was stuff approaching. Long before the storm, officials released online maps. They divided the area into mandatory evacuation zones and voluntary evacuation zones. This is Greg Tebby's property. It's in the voluntary evacuation zone. So he sent his family away, but stayed here. He stayed in a house that eventually came apart. When you looked at this map, you were basing your safety and the safety of your family on this map that you got from officials. I mean, partly. It certainly helped me decide it was okay to stay. If my entire house had been in a potential flood zone, I would not have stayed. Flood zones, evacuation zones, they're all underneath the mountain. When that mountain comes apart, it's still very hard for scientists to predict exactly where the pieces will fall. I just felt something bad is about to happen. There's just debris everywhere. Greg remembers waking up inside a nightmare. His neighborhood was being crushed. And I saw little flashes of things going by, and it, those are boulders, like going down the street. Did you get a sense of how big these boulders were that were, that were flowing past you? Yes, I did a bit, because honestly, before the mud flow hit, I, I heard like a roar approaching. And that, then I felt, okay, there's a mudslide coming. What he heard was that door blowing open in an explosion, a torrent of all this sticky mud coming through. He was trapped. But in an ingenious move, Greg actually set up pieces of furniture one by one through the hallway so he could precariously walk along them. What you gotta keep in mind is this was in the middle of the night. It was pitch black, there was no light, but the only way to get out is to build the bridge. Every other exit from his house was covered in mud. There were sort of two mud flows going through my house. In front of and behind your front stairs. Front and back, and just, you know, yeah. my main concern was, is this gonna get bigger? Is my house gonna start disintegrating in this mud? So how did you get out of the house? There were pockets of dryness in my back porch, so I could actually get outside to the back porch where we had some more outdoor furniture. Did the same thing, I sort of jury-rigged stepping stones and I got to the point where I could get off my property. There were a couple times at the very beginning when you're thinking, wow, I, I, I hope something doesn't go through my house right now and I'm sitting here. So if the destruction raged all the way from the mountain to the sea, why did the mandatory evacuation zone stop at the 192 freeway above the area where home after home was crushed and lives lost? It wasn't in our planning that we would get the type of intensity 
in the short duration that we got. And later. The sediment sits there, waits like a loaded gun till the rainfall comes. This experiment, a man-made mudslide in a scientific lab, could help prevent future loss of life like the chaos these neighbors witnessed the night it rained boulders. The main thing I remember is just the, the sound of glass breaking. It all started when a fire swept through the hillside. Then the rainstorm came, and that water pushed big rocks onto a sleeping town. I also started hearing people yelling for help. Montecito, California will never be the same after the night it rained boulders. At the crack of dawn, firefighters were already on the ground. Cars had been swept out to sea. A child was buried alive, then rescued from underneath her parents' collapsed roof. The boulders came down the mountain at top speed. They had been anchored in place by trees and 20-foot high chaparral for decades, perhaps centuries. That was before the historic Thomas Fire, the largest in state history. There was nothing holding these rocks in anymore. You think of a flood, and people think of water. You think of a mudslide, they think of it, it. There's pictures in their in their head about what that is. This was something entirely different. It was a debris flow. It was a boulder fall, you said. A, well, there's fields of boulders now that weren't there a week and a half ago. Uh, my name's Pat McElroy. I'm the fire chief for the city of Santa Barbara. There are some that I've seen that are about as high as 18 or 20 feet. We saw it firsthand. Some boulders rumbled through occupied homes as if they were made of tissue paper. People were killed. People were swept away in the mud. Chief McElroy predicted it. We knew that this was a possibility. We didn't anticipate the gravity. Before it happened, local, county, and state fire rescue teams put themselves in place. They started staffing up, ordered resources like swift water rescue teams. They issued warnings, divided Montecito into two evacuation zones, up against the mountain, mandatory. From the 192 freeway down to the ocean, voluntary. Here's what they didn't expect, a rainstorm pounding those burned hillsides and canyons like it did. It wasn't in our planning that we would get the type of intensity in the short duration that we got. It's a lot of rain. It's a lot of rain really quick. And that was definitely a frightening moment, uh, um, considering the fear of, of the slides. My name is Chris Mills. I live in Montecito, California. So our home is about half a mile south from 192, and no one in that area had a mandatory evacuation orders issued to them. Geologists have studied these canyons for decades, so working together with first responders, they thought they knew generally where the mud and debris would flow. Nature has a funny way of rewriting the rules. That looks like a bowl and a funnel to me. Yeah, don't you want to describe it? I'm happy with that. You know, I mean, it, but it definitely is a drainage, is the way I look at it. That comes down in here. That was our other major debris flow that went through San Ysidro Canyon, San Ysidro Ranch, and then again exited at the ocean. No disaster is always um, as easy to anticipate. The firefighters who risked their lives to pull people from the mud are American heroes. The people who drew the maps warning families in potential disaster zones are just as heroic. Yet homes were crushed, neighborhoods were flattened, all the way from the mountain to the sea, not just in the mandatory evacuation zone. Some people's homes got destroyed in the voluntary evacuation zones. Right. It really didn't matter whether you were in, in the voluntary or, or the mandatory evacuation area. I think everybody in that Montecito area uh, was at risk. So, so do you think that the wording should have been stronger? Yeah, I hate to blame. Well, yeah, I do. I really do. I think that it, it seems to be, I guess now that I see it as being so obvious, I guess I should have gotten my family out of there. The mandatory evacuation zone is above this highway here. Yeah. But below this highway, it's all voluntary. It was voluntary. Why wasn't it mandatory for this entire thing if you I'm not the person. To, I'm not the person to answer that question. Okay, that's, that's, uh, I, uh, 
We were, we were trying to warn people. A county spokesperson told me the evacuation map was a group decision by a number of leaders, explaining we don't have the science fully to predict mudslides. We do our best with the information we have. The science argument checks out. We will explore that in just a bit. We've been asking a lot of this community. They were evacuated for as, for as much as 10 days during the Thomas fire. Um, I, I, uh, I'm not gonna blame anybody for the decisions that they had to make for themselves and their family. We just need to help people recover from it, learn from it, and maybe do things differently in the future. But what does the future look like when you live in a city underneath the danger? Are we gonna rebuild? And if we do, is that a smart move? Is this all gonna happen again? This was just a tragedy. It's a tragedy for this whole community. Okay, we're on the Thomas Fire in Ventura County, just off the 101, and you can hear it crackling here. I'm gonna walk away from here because this fire is coming up the ridge. It's gonna get very close to us in any moment. So that is the very latest as the ash kind of gets in my eyes. What started as a brush fire grew into an out of control blaze that swept across Southern California, burning mountains and cities. 35 Alpha coming down. But this is not the story of the largest wildfire in California history. This is the story of what came next. Yeah, I'm over here. And I told him, I said, no, I, th I think it's coming from this pile. And I can start hearing people yelling for help. We're talking a tsunami of debris. We didn't anticipate the gravity. The fire set up a series of events that would end like this. An entire community buried in boulders. I'm 5'9", this is nearly double my height. Those rocks came rolling down a mountain in the dark of night. They were pushed by a colossal rainstorm. I just felt something bad is about to happen. This is the story of the city of Montecito. It was the night more than 20 people would die in a torrent of mud, tree trunks, and pieces of rock that washed into homes, knocking down walls and crushing cars. This is the story of the night. It rained boulders. I woke up at 4 a.m. to this huge bright orange light in the sky. It looked like daytime. The burning sky was an ominous foreshadowing of what was to come. My backyard illuminated. It was almost bright as day. When you see rain coming down as hard as it was and a fire, we had no clue what was going on. It was bright and getting brighter. What did you think that was? I had no idea what it was. Neighbors down below knew a mudslide was possible. However, they did not know what to make of a fire that would not go out even in a storm. Then I could tell it really looked like a gas-fed fire. And it would go out any other way if it wasn't gas-fed. Right, because it was, I mean, it was raining so hard. I had just read something before going to bed about North Korea and thinking, oh my God, well, I mean, obviously Santa Barbara would not be a, a target for North Korea, but everything was going through my mind. It was, it was kind of ridiculous thinking without a doubt. So what was the blast that nearly everyone saw just before that deadly boulder fall? In the days after the destruction, we hiked to the site of the explosion to investigate. This is where that orange sky came from. We reached out to SoCal Gas. A spokesperson confirmed the transmission pipeline was damaged in the debris flow. They also tell us they have automatic shutoff equipment that eventually stopped the blaze. And that's still under investigation, so, uh, but it, it came from a gas line being ruptured. The city of Santa Barbara's outgoing fire chief told us the blaze was most likely caused by an already rolling boulder slamming into that gas line. It was an effect of what was already happening. It torched the earth as the boulders and mud took out home after home. My name is Chris Mills. I live in Montecito, California. If you've heard of Chris's Montecito neighborhood before, it may be because some of the most famous names in entertainment live next door. We have uh, two well-known neighbors. We live near Oprah Winfrey, just at the bottom of her property. And we have two homes over. We have Jeff Bridges. Before the storm, Chris and his family secured their home with sandbags, thinking that would be more than enough protection. But boy, did we underestimate what we would need. 
He chose to stay here in the voluntary evacuation zone with his family, including teenage kids and big dogs downstairs. The first sign of danger was that explosion. Then came the deluge of trees, cars, boulders, and mud. It looked like lava surrounding our house. And as it hit the wall, it was just unbelievable how loud that was. Were you thinking about the worst case scenarios here? Absolutely. I've never in my life had the fear that I could not protect my family. Chris actually talked to his family about the possibility of escaping to the roof or a nearby tree, but they were afraid it would be too slick. They could fall into the mud flow and be swept away. Some people were swept away that night. Every aspect was terrifying. The fire in the sky, the boulders flying at their home, the relentless roar of it all. Can you describe it? The video? No, the, the sound? It was really, I mean, we're at the ocean. It's very similar to uh, the crashing of a wave, but lasting for probably 10 minutes that it lasted. So if a wave was crashing and you extend that sound. Exactly right. I ran down bottom of the stairs. Our dogs actually sleep in our kitchen in kennels. And I look over to our uh, kitchen, see the dogs in the kennel and the mud is literally up to their necks. Imagine that scenario, the dogs inside these crates coming up to their necks in all this mud as it's pouring through. Then you have to lift the dog and take him out. That's another issue. Watch how hard it is just to walk through here. Every time you put your foot down, it wants to suck your boots right off. Could you imagine doing that without the proper flood gear? Almost impossible. He went through our garage door from the outside and then went through the garage door into our kitchen. And it was our whole bottom level of our house. Well, that's interesting. Look how the French doors actually held back almost a foot of mud right there. Super wet, super muddy in here. Not a drop out there. And I'm not doing this for effect. This is really how tough it is to walk through a house that's destroyed by a debris flow like this. The rain-powered mud and debris flow had so much energy behind it, the flow went in unpredictable directions. One official told us it seemed to be flowing uphill at times. Went down to the, uh, the bricks right here and the firefighters came in and grabbed us out of here. The earlier Thomas fire had stripped the mountain of its ability to keep boulders in place. So they went speeding down the canyons, taking the lives of friends and family. I knew uh, some of the victims as well. Two large wildfires are burning in my district. Congressman Salute Carbajal represents California's 24th district. Oh, I was devastated. It's. Um, you know, uh, one person in particular, I had just been in an airplane by coincidence. Riskin Partners posted this on Facebook. In the seat next to the congressman was Rebecca Riskin. She would be killed Rebecca Riskin the night those boulders came rolling into town. My two and a half year old who loved his grandma, I was at the zoo with him last weekend and I saw other grandmas with their little toddlers and families and it hurt a lot to you know, not be able to have my mom with us. The confirmation of her loss is incredibly devastating to her friends, family, and our community. It was beyond our wildest imagination um, what happened. Chris Mills's family didn't know if they'd survive the night. And even now, the mountain is still bare. There are still plenty of boulders up there with nothing to hold them back. How long would this take to clean up, do you think? Years? I mean, yeah. Years. A year would be extremely optimistic. I think even two years is probably going to be extremely optimistic. Any time after you have a natural disaster, there are those discussions and inevitable considerations. Are we going to rebuild? And if we do, is that a smart move? Is, it, is this all going to happen again? People are on edge, and I think every time it rains, people will, will get out of the way. That's going to define how the community rebuilds and how it looks going into the future. Is it safe to rebuild in Montecito? There's more of the mountain that could come down. There is more of the mountain that can come down. That's a job for the planners of this community. Montecito has definitely, uh, is completely different and I don't, I don't know how a lot of people are going to go back into Montecito. Together, we will heal. At the same time, 90% of Montecito was unaffected and looks exactly the same. 
how do we reset up the gas lines? How do we reset up the electrical? How do we set up our sanitation districts? How do we set up all these things that people depend on to live for the future? And that's exactly where we are about to take you, into the future. This is a scientific experiment the size of a warehouse. I'm a geomorphologist, and that means geomorphology. I... Geomorphologist. Geomorphologist. Exactly what triggers a massive movement of boulders is a mystery, even to career geomorphologists. The sediment sits there, waits like a loaded gun. The latest research says it may have something to do with these barely visible particles. The flash floods right there! Get out of here, go! What we really had here was a massive movement of rock. Water and boulders as big as cars. The fear that I could not protect my family. Close the door! Wake that up! This is what it felt like the night the mountain came apart, sending chunks of rock tumbling at high speed towards sleeping families. It was the middle of the night. It rained boulders. You see people putting up sandbags and these sort of things to protect their property. But if the flow is able to carry boulders, then it certainly can uh, go through your sandbags. Before the city of Montecito went to bed, local leaders divided the town into two evacuation zones, mandatory and voluntary. But homes were crushed in both zones. Part of the issue is our uh, ability or inability to accurately predict where these debris flows are going to occur. Dr. Michael Lamb would know he's dedicated the last 20 years of his life to studying the way the earth is shaped and how its pieces move. We are not at the point where we can accurately predict exactly when and where debris flows will hit. Here at the California Institute of Technology, Dr. Lamb's team have built what they call the Earth Surface Dynamics Laboratory. It's basically a man-made mudslide. The use of the word mudslide or mud flow probably should be abandoned. It's often what's said uh, in the news. If you think about these debris flows as carrying as much rock as a rock avalanche and is more like boulders rather than mud. So you could call them boulder flows, for example. As we have said before, this was no mudslide. It was the night it rained so hard, boulders started to fall. But what kind of rain triggers a boulder flow? It's mother nature. And you never can say exactly where you're going to get the debris flow. There's a lot that we don't know. For example, why did they happen during some rainstorms and not others? Why only after some wildfires? Studying unpredictable boulder flows in the wild is basically impossible. So by making uh, indoor experiments like we have here, we can try to study uh, debris flows in a safer, more controlled environment. In here, it's pebbles. Out there, boulders were 15 to 20 feet across, wider than the flood channels themselves. So it's no wonder that the channels got plugged up and overflowed. Water follows the path of least resistance, carrying catastrophe into family homes. This was half an inch in five minutes. So if that water would have been spread out even over in hours rather than minutes, it's possible that these flows wouldn't have been as large. Here is what science is just starting to understand. It's not the total amount of rain that falls during a given storm, but it might be a burst of rain that happens over just a few minutes. See those tiny particles swirling around? They represent the loose, sandy, ashy grain no longer held in place by big shrubs burned away in a wildfire. That loose material just starts rolling and bouncing down the hillsides. The sediment sits there, waits, like a loaded gun till the rainfall comes. When you rain on that material hard, it can trigger debris flows. First responders and scientists in labs both seem to think this unusually long fire season at least contributed to the disaster. Yeah, I don't think anybody was anticipating the largest brush fire in California history to be happening through Christmas. If this fire had burned in the summer, the devastation may not have happened. There's a period of several months, usually, where they sit there until the rainy season begins. Lately, rainy season, fire season, it's all the same. What our experience is telling us is the fire season's year-round. There is no doubt in my mind that we are seeing major 
weather patterns changing. We've been in the longest drought in California history, and the area that burned had not received any rainfall, any significant rainfall over the last two years. The first rainstorm that we had of the year was a big one. The research being done in this lab seems to point to this fact. Lots of little storms over a long period of time will wash away those little pieces, taking the danger level down a notch. The main point to this experiment is to find out what triggers a debris flow. I think it's very impressive that they can take a real life situation with these massive boulders and then put it down into this small scale and run experiments on it that will hopefully save people and homes in the future. See that yellow rock there? It's actually a sensor sending data back to the computer. In the future, all of that data could be used to help build an early warning system. And once we know why, we can start asking more important questions like, will this change if we have more fires or if we have climate change? How will this threshold between rivers and debris flows change? I, I just hope that there are smart people who are working on technologies to kind of help this prevent, you know, prevent this from happening. For now, there is no early warning system, just those easily ignored evacuation zones. It's very difficult to forecast where a boulder is going to go. It's gonna go wherever it wants to go. Sure, with that in mind, there's just no reason to take the risk. Maybe it's better that you do leave, and I wish I had left, actually, and, and not put myself in that, that uh, precarious position. What kind of situation did Bobby Cartagena find himself in? So you tried to call AAA to help you out of a natural disaster. Because I didn't realize how bad the natural disaster was at that point. It's one hell of a story, and it's coming up next. Wake up! Get, get, get ready to go out. Wake that up. By now, you have seen how mudslides are rarely just mud. In fact, the use of the word mudslide or mud flow probably should be abandoned. It's more like boulders rather than mud. A mudslide is an inconvenience. This is a mountainside that came down. By now, you have seen the boulder fall that rolled into occupied homes at top speed. Rain pushed mud down the canyons as it mixed with a deadly slurry of tree trunks, smashed dumpsters, crush cars. That is what cracked these homes in half. I should have gotten my family out of there. Why wasn't it mandatory for this entire thing? We were trying to warn people. Despite warnings, there were many people who chose to stay through what became the night at rain boulders. I don't know why I thought I could ride the storm out. I mean, perhaps I thought, you know, it, it couldn't happen to me. This is Bobby Cartagena. He sells all that high-tech equipment you see in the dentist office. I stayed behind because uh, I had several meetings on Tuesday that, that I needed to get to. He was in for one nail biter of a day. In the middle of the night, an explosion. Then the mountain started to fall. I could feel the ground shake from all the boulders that were coming down. We had already heard about the uh, mandatory evacuation for our neighborhood. You hear that? Bobby was in the mandatory evacuation zone. And I wish I had left, actually, and, and not put myself in that, that uh, precarious position. By the time the rock started moving, his ordeal was just beginning. It started when he tried to drive out. Made it about a quarter of a mile, and then the car got stuck in about three feet of mud. I called AAA, thinking that you know I could get a tow truck out to kind of winch, winch the car out. So you tried to call AAA to help you out of a natural disaster. I tried to call AAA to help me out of a natural disaster because I didn't realize how bad the natural disaster was at that point. A disaster that killed more than 20 of his neighbors. Just barely out of his driveway, Bobby was stuck in the mud. Opening the car door just made things worse as all that gooey mud bubbled in. I ended up climbing out the passenger side and climbing up on top of the roof of the car and then sliding black down and you know, got into the mud. It was about ankle deep at that point. So I packed a backpack with as many clothes as I could, put on some boots, and I grabbed a bike thinking that maybe I could bike out of the neighborhood. And uh, I got about a quarter of a mile down the road. I just couldn't go anymore and the mud was too thick to ride through. So I picked up the bike and I put it on my shoulders and I started to walk. And really quickly the mud went from ankle deep to knee deep to waist deep. I was also watching helicopters starting to take off and land. That's when it really dawned on me that this is a major catastrophe. I didn't know what streets were filled with mud and what streets weren't. 
Each step was a gamble. There were hot power lines, open manholes, and mud that pulled you under like quicksand. If I'm going to move forward, I'm going to move forward in small increments and take breaks. One step at a time, with a bike on his back, Bobby walked out of that dangerous day. You've seen how hard it is to walk from one room to another. Can you imagine doing that for several miles? I made it to the church, cleaned myself off, got a change of clothes together, and I was evacuated out on uh, one of those military trucks. These are the boots that you were wearing. They still have mud on them. They're still muddy, yeah. even though I hosed them off twice. The reality is, over the next two years, there's still plenty of debris that could flow down. They're still very vulnerable. The new normal for Montecito is that we could very well be involved with something like this again here in the near future. I'm doing the best I can to stay resilient. And so are all of her neighbors. But if you take a look at this map, you'll see the problem goes way beyond Montecito. Zoom out and you'll see yellow high-risk zones and red extreme-risk zones stretching over a 14-mile wide area. You know, it's sad because our world is today is all about these news bites and every day you hear, you know, so many people were killed in this tragedy and so many in this and it's not the same until you've actually experienced it yourself. The massive cleanup began the very next day. First crews dug out the freeway, then they had to do something with all those boulders. Some were chemically broken apart, others were literally tossed aside. This is extraordinary. Watch as this crew with heavy equipment picks up these boulders just one at a time and slowly moves it to the other side of the street. This is how you clear the neighborhood, slow and steady. But keep in mind, this disaster happened in an instant, proving nature can always move boulders way faster than excavators ever could. For the Weather Channel Explorers, I'm Dave Malcolm.